I'm going to be talking about how uh, I do the cocker langenbeck approach to the acetabulum. And uh, we'll go through the usual indications, how to position the patient in theater, uh, the skin incision, superficial and deep dissection, and, the, and finally the closure. So the main reason for uh, performing a cocker langenbeck approach is an acetabular fracture, and uh, it allows good access to the posterior uh, aspect of the acetabulum. So um, any posterior wall fracture, any posterior column fracture, or a combination of the two um, are, are most commonly the indications for a cocker langenbeck approach. There are other uh, patterns of acetabular fractures that, uh, um, that can be treated uh, with this approach as well. So the reason it's a good uh, uh, approach to the posterior aspect of the acetabulum is, um, is, as you can see here, the shaded area in blue shows what you can see directly with this approach. So you can see the posterior wall and the whole of the posterior, pretty much most of the posterior column from the sciatic notch down to the, the greater to the lesser sciatic notch. And then the shaded pink areas are where you can palpate uh, and, and, and get an uh, a feel of these areas uh, and affect reduction in a, in, a, in a reasonable way. And so the image on the right shows the inner side of the uh, acetabulum. So it's shaded the uh, quadrilateral plate. And so with your finger through the sciatic knot, you can feel the quadrilateral plate. We'll touch upon the green area a bit later uh, in this talk. So here's just an image of someone's finger through the sciatic notch, palpating the quadrilateral plate. I think it's quite ambitious. You probably can't get all the way to the front, but you certainly can feel the, 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 the medial aspect of the posterior column and the quadrilateral plate through the posterior approach. So in terms of uh, positioning in theatre, uh, so I put them on a Jackson table. I uh, put them in a lateral position. You can do this approach through a, uh, with a, uh, the patient in a prone position, but I prefer to do it in a lateral position. I'm more familiar with that and, and often the fracture pattern. Uh, is easier to, to um, affect, the fracture is easier to affect in this position. There are some scenarios where a prone pr approach is slightly uh, more uh, beneficial, um, but we'll just talk about the lateral position today. I use a bean bag uh, to avoid any uh, interference with clamps when, uh, when x-raying. The skin incision is not that dissimilar to what you're familiar with, maybe with a posterior approach. So uh, centered over the femoral shaft, the tip of the GT and curved backwards towards the posterior superior iliac spine, as you can see here. Uh, and then the superficial dissection, again, not that dissimilar to your posterior approach to the hip. So an incision through the iliotibial band or the fascia and then curved uh, along the fibers of the gluteus maximus, as you can see here, splitting the fibers and being careful not to disrupt the neurovascular structures uh, proximal to the, uh, uh, the proximal end of the incision. And then you're presented with this, uh, uh, this view. Uh, I sometimes take off the gluteus maximus insertion that gives you uh, a much more exposure uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the acetabulum. And certainly in those uh, young, um, big muscular men, this is a really good uh, um, uh, step to do to give you a bit more exposure. So at this point you're thinking, hang on a second, this is pretty much like the posterior approach to the hip. So what's the, what's the difference? You know, why is the Koch and Langenbeck uh, 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 any different to the posterior approach? Well, the difference lies in the deep dissection uh, uh, of this approach. And the, and the fundamental uh, um, reason for the Koch and Langenbeck approach is to preserve the blood supply to the femoral head. And as you know, this is predominantly or in a large part supplied by the medial femoral circumflex uh, artery. Uh, and, um, and clearly a posterior approach to the hip for a hip replacement, you don't need to preserve the blood supply to the femoral head, you're replacing it. Whereas when you're um, trying to achieve reduction to the acetabulum, the last thing you want to do is to disrupt the blood supply to the femoral head, develop AVN of the femoral head and, 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 uh, and end up needing, um, needing uh, to uh, do a hip replacement down the line. So we want, we want to avoid disrupting the femoral head blood supply. So I have a few rules to go through. Rule number one is leave a 10 millimeter cuff of piriformis tendon when incising the uh, short external rotators. So here, 
uh, you can see that um, you've, I've left a little bit of the, the image, image shows that I've left a little bit of a cuff uh, and not taking the piriformis right at its insertion into the GT. And the reason for that, again, is to, to preserve the medial femoral circumflex arterial, to preserve the blood supply to the femoral head, um, which you can see running here along the posterior ridge of the uh, greater trochanter uh, up, up, up from distal to proximal. Uh, and here, this image uh, is a nice image where it shows that the kind of blue area is the danger zone. So if you start making any incisions in the, in the, in the blue zone, you're at risk of damaging the ascending medial femoral circumflex artery. And so leaving a 10 millimeter uh, cuff uh, when, in, when making an incision through the piriformis and the short external rotators, you preserve that blood supply. Rule number two is do not incise the quadratus femoris tendon. And so the reason for that is, so you've got the quadratus femoris tendon, which kind of overlaps the obturator externus at the back. And as you know, the, the uh, medial femoral circumflex or medial circumflex femoral artery runs along the lower border of obturator externus. So um, if you make an incision that's proximal to the border of quadratus femoris, then you're well safe of damaging this uh, medial femoral circumflex uh, artery. So those are the two rules there. The third rule is once you've taken off the, um, the short external rotators, or as you're taking those short external rotators off, you need to identify the greater and the lesser sciatic notches to, in your head, know where you are uh, in space, and you know where you're, you know, you find yourself uh, in the pelvis, and you don't, you don't get lost. So you can see the piriformis tendon here um, peeled back, and as you peel this piriformis tendon back um, by dissecting between this tendon and the capsule. You, as you follow it down, you will, you will naturally run into the greater sciatic notch. So you can see this image here, the piriformis runs out of the sciatic notch onto the GT. And so as you peel that piriformis tendon off the capsule, and then you follow that, uh, uh, that uh, tendon down into the pelvis, you will naturally fall into the uh, greater sciatic notch. So with your finger, you can follow down into the greater sciatic notch. And this is where you can palpate the, the medial aspect of the acetabulum that I showed you uh, earlier on in, 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 in the presentation. So the second thing to do is, um, is to identify the lesser sciatic notch. So you follow the uh, obturator internus, and, and obviously this is uh, less clear, uh, but it's, the, it's, the, it's the, uh, the, the rest of the short external rotators. And as you peel the, sh the rest of the short external rotators off the capsule, you'll fall naturally into the lesser sciatic notch. And here you can see an image of the obturator internus, which runs through the lesser sciatic notch. So you can imagine as you peel that off, your finger will naturally follow um, into the lesser sciatic notch where you can in insert a retractor. So this image, shows you the two retractors, one in the greater sciatic notch, one in the lesser sciatic notch. The greater sciatic uh, notch retractor is a little bit chunkier. It, uh, it protects the sciatic nerve, you can see uh, just, just underneath that. Uh, and then and the lesser sciatic notch retractor um, protects the, also protects the sciatic nerve, but, but there's a layer of um, short external rotators between the retractor and the nerve. So at this point, you can extend the exposure slightly more uh, distal. And uh, some textbooks talk about taking the um, quadratus femoris off the GT. But as I said earlier, I try to avoid that in order to avoid damaging that blood vessel. And so what I do is I use a diathermy and just take a little bit off the quadratus femoris off its um, uh, origin at the um, uh, at the ischium or the uh, aspect of the aspect of the posterior column that you need to expose. And at this point, you need you, we're, we're, we're hoping to protect the sciatic nerve. And so we need to relax the sciatic nerve, take the stretch of the sciatic nerve. And in order to do that, you need to extend the hip and flex the knee. And the way I do this and, and the way I try to, not to forget to do this is I have the patient's um, uh, shin uh, resting on my uh, abdomen, uh, and uh, and in that way I can um, uh, flex the knee and extend the hip whilst having my hands free 
still to operate on 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 the acetabulum. limit. So this is the kind of uh, position that I'm in when I'm uh, operating at the back of the uh, um, posterior column, trying to avoid stretching the sciatic nerve. So the the last rule um, is do not perform a capsulotomy. So in a lot of textbooks and even on the AO website, you will see um, uh, uh, this. Um, suggestion that at this point you should perform a, uh, a, a, a T capsulotomy and in some scenarios that is uh, appropriate uh, but in this scenario of an acetabular fracture with a posterior wall or a posterior column um, uh, doing a capsulotomy is not uh, recommended certainly I, I, I don't think it's a good idea so this image just demonstrates to you why that's not a good idea. So you've got the, the green uh, rubbery um, uh, thing on this model, which represents the capsule. And beh behind this, you can see the fracture lines here and here of the posterior wall. And so what you don't want to do is to incise that capsule. You want to keep that capsule completely intact, but to um, open up the fracture from the posterior uh, of the posterior wall and so you can see on this image on the right uh, we've managed to get a, um, a periosteal elevator between into the fracture and affecting the uh, marginal depression uh, of the acetabular fracture by going through the fracture not that dissimilar to any other kind of intra-articular uh, approach you would take for example a tibial plateau fracture you would go through the fracture and elevate the fragment so this is the same sort of thing, but you can see how you preserve this capsular labral attachment to the small bony fragment, thereby preserving the blood supply and actually makes things a lot easier when it comes to reconstructing uh, with plates and screws. So don't perform a capsulotomy and, and, and then this uh, image shows how you can uh, uh, reduce the posterior uh, uh, wall fracture with uh, lag screws and then neutralize it with a plate. And finally, uh, the closure, uh, and a part of the closure that's really crucial is to avoid this complication following an acetabular fracture. This is, uh, 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 you can see quite extensive uh, HO uh, following uh, fixation of the acetabulum. And um, there are lots of uh, um, factors that can affect uh, the, um, the, the progression of H. HO post fixation. But for me, the key uh, is to debride the gluteus minimus muscle. Um, obviously, as much as looks contused and, um, uh, and bruised, uh, but also when you're doing the approach, it's also useful to excise uh, gluteus uh, minimus so that it allows you to uh, have better exposure of the acetabulum and puts less force through the minimus muscles and thereby creating more trauma to the minimus muscle. So that's a key element of, uh, of finishing up this, um, this approach. And finally, uh, you can repair the short external rotators. Uh, obviously, it's not like the posterior approach where you have to drill through the GT. You've still got the cuff uh, on, on the GT side to repair onto with sutures. And at this point, it's really disappointing to inadvertently jab the uh, vessel that you've been trying to preserve the whole way through. So be careful not to not to damage the, um, the, the, the blood vessel to the femoral head. And finally, repair the gluteus maximus insertion to avoid any asymmetry in the, in, in, in the buttock region. Um, and that's the Koppel-Langenbeck approach.